As many of you know, the City Council has been celebrating the centenary of the birth of Captain Arthur Andrew Cipriani, who was born 100 years ago on this day. Cipriani's contribution to our city, to public life in these islands, and to the welfare of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago has been immense. Between 1929 and 1940, Captain Cipriani has been mayor of this city on eight occasions. As the present mayor of Port of Spain, it gives me great pleasure in introducing this special television program entitled Captain of the People, The Life and Times of Arthur Andrew Cipriani. As I listen to his voice speaking to us from the distance of 40 years, Reverting to our claims for self-government, the whole point at issue is the old story of taxation without representation. A policy as vexatious and unsatisfactory to us in these colonies as it has proved itself to be in other parts of the empire in the past and will continue so to do in the future. As far back as 1924, Trinidad was granted a modicum of representation as a result of the Wood Commission made up of Major Wood, now Lord Halifax, and Mr. Ormsby Gore, the present Secretary of State for the Colonies, and the existing Constitution was framed with the recommendation that representation would be extended as time went on until the nominated principle was done away with and superseded by a full complement elected by the people. Today we find Mr. Ormsby Gore in his official position of Secretary of State for the Colonies, one of the two gentlemen responsible for the recommendation above referred to in 24, feigning complete ignorance of his own report. During the report, the period under review, Trinidad has ranged herself in the forefront of Commonwealth reckoning. Her mineral and agricultural wealth call for the attention of the civilized world, and it is no empty boast to make this statement that square inch for square inch, she is one of the richest units of the empire. But it would take more time to describe the extent of economic oppression under which we have to carry on, as well as the petty tyranny and a regime of small-minded pin-pricking which characterizes the policy of Crown Colony rule. Let us not omit to bring to the minds of the British public that in these colonies live the most sincerely and truthfully loyal of His Majesty's subjects. And while we feel proud to be members and partners of the great Commonwealth of Nations, we smart under the stigma of being known or referred to as subject races. That was the voice of Arthur Andrew Cipriani, who was born in Port of Spain on January the 30th, 1875, 100 years ago today, speaking in 1936 on self-government for Trinidad and Tobago. His parents were Albert Henry and Alice, his mother's maiden name, Agostini. His father was a planter in the Santa Cruz Valley, and the Cipriani's were of Corsican descent and closely related to the Bonaparte family. They had come to Trinidad in the first half of the 19th century. As the road from Santa Cruz through Maribel into Port of Spain was not open to vehicular traffic until 1909, Albert Henry would have taken the young Arthur over the saddle road by horse. Father and son would have rested in the village of Maribel. They would have been welcome at the presbytery of the Roman Catholic Church. The Church of the Purification as the fine marble altar there had been donated by Arthur's uncle, Joseph Emmanuel, solicitor, racehorse owner, and seven times mayor of Port of Spain. For the first six years of his life, Arthur Cipriani lived in the lovely valley of Santa Cruz, one of the first districts to be planted with the Criolla variety of cocoa. The Cipriani estate was a part of the original Spanish grant in early times to Pedro Balmontes. stretching from La Pastora and its church in the north to Curacay in the outskirts of San Juan village and the present Valmont estate in the south. During 1825, 
a period of extreme drought devastated the Crayola cocoa. And it was replaced with new and more vigorous varieties, such as the Forestero and Calabaco. Some sugarcane was grown, but by the year of Arthur's birth, 1875, the main crop was cocoa, with subsidiary crops of coffee and tonka beans. By the time Arthur was 15, there were about 25 planters in the valley. Bord, Coriat, Mango, Penko, Laparus, Angeron, Leffer, Dumouray, with the Cyprianis among them. And the names of some of the plantations were Perseverance, San Antonio, La Pastora, La Prosperidad, Gasparillo, Le Regalada, La Desiada, and Eugenie. Today, the surrounding hills are still well covered with natural growth, with here and there stands of valuable timber, cedar, sip, mahogany and olivier, and as yet, the valley has not suffered from any degree of erosion. It is well watered by the Santa Cruz or Aricagua. The Lacanoa and the Curacai rivers, which are all fed by springs that rise in the enclosing hills. The people of the valley are a mixture of many races, Aboriginal Indian, Spanish, French, African, and finally East Indian. Their language was originally Spanish, replaced by French patois. But now, except for the very old folk, our Trinidad version of English is spoken by all. Relatively untouched by the hand of modern progress, the valley remains a beautiful and peaceful retreat from the hustle and bustle of our age. And there is no lovelier sight than the stately immortal in bloom during the month of February. Arthur's abiding love for the countryside and all things of the earth must have had its first awakening during these early years of childhood spent innocently in the valley of Santa Cruz. On entering Port of Spain from the east, all vehicles up to 1878 had to pay a toll at the toll gate, still standing on the old St. Joseph Road. Arthur and his two brothers were orphaned in 1881, when he was six years of age. In that year, the present bells of Trinity Cathedral rang out for the first time. Port of Spain was on the verge of expansion and rebuilding, which would continue and increase up to the present day. As yet, however, it was still the town that Governor Woodford had laid out in a regular manner after the devastating fire of 1808. Broadway was then known as the Almond Walk, graced with its royal palms and two rows of almond trees. The commercial newsroom, now occupied by the police traffic branch, had been erected adjoining the small harbor fort of San Andres, built during the last years of the Spanish occupation. The Anglican Cathedral dominated the center of the town and overlooked Brunswick Square, since renamed Woodford Square, where in 1866, an elegant fountain had been installed, donated by a merchant, Mr. Gregor Turnbull of Glasgow, Scotland. In 1882, a new law came into force on the 1st of February, compelling liquor shops to close at 9 a.m. on Sundays. And as a result, illicit rum sellers did a brisk trade in the vicinity of the George Street entrance to the old market. During 1883, the Fire Brigade Corps was formed. The mule tramways began operating, and a start was made in the organizing of a telephone service, which was inaugurated in 1885. The spacious boulevard was named after Arthur's uncle, Joseph Emmanuel, who had improved the lighting of the city, and as mayor was responsible for the development of the tranquility area. He died in 1884. In 1885, Strong's Piano Factory was established. And it was in 1887 that the first discussions concerning the annexation of Tobago to Trinidad were held in official circles. In garrison at St. James Barracks, a detachment of the York and Lancashire Regiment sailed in 1889 for Barbados, 
leaving the island without any imperial troops for the first time since the British occupation in 1797. The following year, the police took permanent control of St. James Barracks and a detachment of 50 armed policemen was stationed there. In 1890, the Queen's Park Hotel came into being. Against this background of the growing of modern Port of Spain, Arthur began his 10 years of school by attending the private school of a Mrs. Jenkins at the medical hall, which stood at the corner of Park and St. Vincent streets. From there, he went to St. Mary's College, whose principal then was Father Brown. The life there was rough and ready, and there was little interference from the masters. Father Brown, fourth principal of the college, and a good disciplinarian, believed in allowing the boys to settle their differences outside the classroom, within the limits of their own youthful laws. Arthur spent nine years at the college, and he was a good athlete and runner, some of his classmates being Carl de Bertay, Gaston Johnson, the LaSalle brothers Charles and John, Joe Schwelt, Dr. Polonais, and Napoleon Raymond. Out of school, there was a great deal to occupy a boy in his spare time in those far-off days. The Grand Savannah, dotted with grazing cattle, was there for games of cricket and football and the catching of butterflies. Across the savannah, past the old cannonball tree, there was the avenue of shading bamboo, which led to the beautiful valleys of St. Anne's, where shaded streams invited you to bathe. To the west of Port of Spain lay the fishing village of Cobo Town, its former site now overlooked by the Holiday Inn. From there, small fishing boats could be hired for sailing and fishing in the harbor. And then, of course, there was the annual celebration of Carnival. In 1891, at the age of 16, Arthur left St. Mary's. He had reached the senior form and had been a fairly good student, though handicapped by an atrocious handwriting that was to survive unimpaired throughout the remainder of his life. 